So Google, I talked a little bit about how they're becoming more social in nature. Um, and so they've launched, some of you guys may have heard of the Google Wave. How many of you guys are using Google Wave? So Google Wave is essentially the email of the 21st century. They've looked at what's happening within social tools and said, okay, we need to kind of enhance the way email works. My personal opinion, I think it's a little too bleeding edge instead of cutting edge. It's a little too far out there. Um, so I've started to use it. I could be wrong, but I think it's a little too out there for the general public. Uh, and that's why Facebook's been so successful. They understand the fastest growing segment on Facebook's uh, females 55 and older. So I often joke that you have to live as if your mother's watching you because she probably is watching you. But on Google's side, they've, they've launched a bunch of tools, but this time I'm gonna show you a 60 second video. We're losing control of our brands, and that's a good thing. It's okay. Let go, let the consumer take it, and if you're doing things well, they're gonna take it in the right direction for you. So a Google SideWiki is just a showcase of how over time you're gonna have less control of your brand. At a high level, what it does, if you go to a website, on the left-hand side, it'll open up a window that shows what users thought about that site or about that product. And so it could be, I love this site, everyone should use it, this is the product that you need to buy. Or it could be, this is the worst site I've ever been to, here's a video of why I think it stinks for 60 seconds. So I'm gonna play this for 60 seconds just to showcase that this is where the whole world is moving to rapidly. So time will tell if that's actually the technology that we use, but the underlying thought will be used. And that's getting back to the whole thought about the TripAdvisor example I gave you. Or if you think about it more from a consumer product standpoint, if you were to buy a child seat, say you had your first baby, and your wife tasks you with, you're in charge of getting the child seat. It's kind of a daunting task to go out and purchase the right thing. This is the safety of your, your first baby. Um, and so today, what would you do? You'd probably do some searches on Google and come up with a bunch of listings. You'd dig through, hopefully find a review site, but you don't know who did those reviews. And over time, you'll make a fairly confident purchase decision. But what's gonna happen with tools like this and other tools like Facebook Connect is that what'll come back is of your 200 Facebook friends, did you know that 30 have purchased a child seat in the last year? And of those 30, 20 have purchased this exact seat and 20 give it a four to five star rating, and here's their comments. So those are people you know. So all of a sudden, as a user, it's great for society. You've reduced your research time down from 10 hours to maybe an hour, and you're very confident in your purchase decision. And so who wins? The consumer wins, and, and who also wins? The company that's providing the product of the best value. Not the best product, but the product of the best value for that particular niche. So another example of the Tom Sawyer approach, again, this is convincing people to paint the fence for you, is that ESPN historically has a couple field reporters that cover, cover the National Football League. So there's three reporters that fly around, like Ed Werder, um, Chris Mortensen, they fly around and try to figure out what's going on with each individual team. Um, and they have various podcasts that are NFL related. But when they realize is that, wait, there's people that are bloggers and also people that live in the town of Green Bay, that have grown up their entire life in Green Bay, that understand everything there is to know about the Green Bay Packers, why don't we utilize them and they'll do it for free because they're just happy to be a part of ESPN. And oh, by the way, it helps stab off the competition because the entry, the barrier to entry is so low for them to do their own podcast. If they're listening to our NFL podcast and they're not covering the Green Bay Packers correctly or enough, they're gonna start their own Green Bay Packer podcast. So you've heard the term, if you can't beat them, join them. 
Well, they're joining them before they can be beaten. So it's a smart play. And so they've got now a blogger in each city and also a super fan in each city. And, and these people can cover those teams better than the three that had to fly around. It saves them, saves them costs as well. But it provides a better end product. So that's a way of thinking differently. And some companies think differently, and other companies don't think differently. So this is a good example. In 2008, the Olympics were over in China. And so NBC covered a lot of it online. But they only covered like ping pong online live. They weren't showing Michael Phelps swimming online live. But if they would have thought about it, why wouldn't they? The reason they don't is because, and I'll get to it in a sec, is they're fearful. It's false evidence appearing real. That's not how they've always operated. And so the reporting from Nielsen doesn't give them credit for the views online. It's through another mechanism that they can see that. And it's actually better tracking being shown through an IP address. And so what they did is it was a bad for the user experience, because a lot of users like myself, I don't pay $150 for cable. I watch everything online. Or if you're at work, you can only watch stuff online. Or if you're traveling, especially internationally, sometimes you can only watch the stuff online. So if they would have thought about it, these are just additional eyeballs to their current sponsors. And all of a sudden, the sponsor just sees a much greater return. And it's no cost to NBC. They just slap on the ads on the online piece while this is running. But instead, what they'd show the ping pong. And when they showed the ping pong, they go to a commercial break. It's just five minutes of dead air. And the consumer doesn't know what the heck's going on. There's just an empty ping pong table for five minutes. Then they come back. So who did it differently? The PGA Tour did it differently. So in 08, it came down to a playoff between Tiger Woods and Rocco Mediate. So they had to go to Monday to play another 18 holes. So they had to make a decision. What are we going to do? Everyone's at work. Should we stream it live? So they make the decision to stream it live. Much of the chagrin of a lot of IT folks across the country, because it shut down company servers <laughs> across the board. But all of a sudden, they get all of this viewership. And they get all this additional revenue from their sponsors because they showed this online. And so then the following year, they learned from that. And in 2009, again, it's at the end, at about the 14th hole, it's all tied up between Tiger Woods and Y.E. Yang from South Korea. But this year, they took it one step further. They go, let's push it all the way out. So they had the ability for people on MySpace, Facebook, and Twitter to talk about the tournament while they were watching it. And it was all aggregated in one place at PGA.com. So then what did that do? At the 14th hole, everyone starts tweeting, I want Tiger, I can't believe it's tied. Oh, I want Y.E. Yang. And people that didn't know that this was going on are all of a sudden the Facebook feed, they go, oh yeah, the golf tournament's on. Oh my gosh, it's tied. Then they click on and watch. So that's how they leveraged social media, the exact opposite of what NBC did, which was one of these. They kind of gave it a big bear hug. And they, they proved out that it was much more effective doing it that way. And so again, a lot of people, this is actually a scuba. For those that scuba dive, I got this from scuba diving. It's false evidence appearing real. So it's really keeping your head when things seem like it's, it's really that I shouldn't be doing something. And so where does this all go back to? It goes back to the music industry. Now I'm giving you guys these examples that may have nothing to do with your particular industry, but I'm sure you've approached it from the same method of we can't do social media because there might be negative comments. Or we can't do social media because of legal restrictions. And so these guys face similar things in a different form, but you'll see that ABC did it right with the PGA, NBC did it wrong with the Olympics. And the music industry did it wrong. So all of a sudden these MP3 players come out, digital music. What does the music industry do? They should have jumped for joy and done cartwheels and embraced everything that they could because they could have realized, wait, I just pay for the music once and it goes directly to the consumer. I don't pay for any distribution costs. I don't have to box this thing up. I don't have a middleman. I don't have to pay Harmony House or whatever big music industry that's out there. And also, I don't have to worry about people stealing the CDs out of the store. But instead, they said, no, we want to make the money how we've always made it. And they lost. And so that's why you see a quote, it's all part of a master plan. The spreadsheets and financial models dictate that suing customers and partners just makes too much sense. So that's the big music executive. They wouldn't give their name. Obviously, I wouldn't either if I had a quote like that associated with it. But that's why Apple was basically able to swoop in and dominate that industry, because they didn't quickly embrace this stuff. If you think about it for your business, if you could have had the power eight years ago on Google 
to embrace search engine optimization and own those keywords that are at the top of the list, those free keywords. Let's say you sell German Christmas gifts and that's the keyword you could have owned for two years. That would have been a dominant place to be in. Those are sometimes worth millions of dollars to be in that placement. So the people that really embraced it from the get-go were the big winners. Because sometimes that window can be two or three years to where you really, really make big noise. So we're also seeing this play out on cable. I kind of alluded to that with NBC and ABC. You'll see that, that's why I like this net neutrality that you hear in, in Washington, D.C. At the end of that debate, really at the point of that debate, is that people like me that don't want to pay the $150 for cable, that's what they're trying to get, because I pay them $30. It's the same people, Comcast provide the same pipe. So instead of paying $150, I pay $30 for my internet connection. They want the $150. So a lot of that debate's about that because they see that everything's going to be served television-wise over an IP address because it's more efficient and you can track it much better. So they realize, oh my gosh, we're going to lose all this money, but hey, we control both pipes. So that's what's really a lot of the, the lobbying's going on in DC. But again, they should embrace it because it's better tracking capability. If they were to attack it and embrace it, they'll be much better off. And the e-readers, how many of you guys have an Amazon Kindle or a Sony e-reader or the new Nook? The same thing's play, playing out in the publishing world is that now everything's going digital. That has a lot of ramifications. What does that mean for libraries? Can everybody access the book at once or is it certain that only five people can check it out at once? Because it's digital, it can be everywhere at once. Uh, but the beauty is if they embrace it and realize, oh my gosh, books are inherently social. So that past long paperback we never got revenue from before, maybe we can get a dollar from that if we do it correctly. And so the customer is more than willing to pay a dollar to get that book. And so they pay $10 here, I pass it to my friend, they get a dollar. So there's a lot of new revenue opportunities. There's revenue opportunities in terms of product placement can go in the books, because now they're digital. If an author's writing about, I drank a soda, Coke can play, put Coca-Cola in there and have it hyperlinked to our site. So it's just some of the stuff that's really moving so fast. It's somewhat mind-boggling, but there's a lot of, lot of opportunity that's out there. And some of you guys may have heard about the Apple tablet or the tablets from Lenovo. Some people say those are about as real as a unicorn. But I, I actually think they're going to come to fruition. And some say that Apple's going to launch it in March. What that is is it's merging your iPhone with your PC all together. And so the media is going to consume. A lot of people call them media machines. You're going to do everything with a 10-inch screen, so about the size of an e-reader. So great companies even make mistakes within social media. You're going to get it wrong when you first do it. That's fine. Take the first step. Your customer's going to tell you what they want you to adjust it to. You're going to make mistakes. That's what it's all about. Even great companies like Apple make mistakes. So they opened up their applications, application program interface so people could write all these apps. So all these programmers could write the various apps, the apps that you have on your iPhone where you can put up to the speaker when you hear a song, you don't know who sings, it'll tell you who the artist is and what the name of the song is. That's what that was all about. They allowed programmers to come in to Apple, which had never been done before, because Apple's historically this closed garden, meaning that it's, you know, we only fish right here, nowhere outside of here, just like AOL. AOL, when you had AOL Instant Messenger, and you could only instant message with people that were on AOL, that was a pain from a consumer standpoint. But AOL did that because they wanted everyone to play in their garden. So who changed and revolutionized the whole world? It was Facebook when they opened up their applications and said, we have an open platform. Make any application that you want on our, on our platform. And that application could be, the, the example before that was, wherever I travel, I'm going to put a little pin, just like I do on my wall. And so TripAdvisor made that application, and 3 million people use that application. And so they changed the world, and Apple opened up to allow for applications to happen. But one application was tapping into the Gutenberg Press Project, which makes 28,000 books available for free. But one of those books is the Kama Sutra. And so Apple thought that they were promoting pornography, so they killed the entire application. But then they got thousands of angry tweets, emails, and calls to why do you take this down? So they reversed their decision a couple hours later. And a lot of companies wouldn't have the courage to do that. But it's just a showcase that even the best companies make mistakes. It's just you have to learn, fail forward, and fail fast when you're out there. 
Um, and making mistakes is what it's all about, and your consumer understands there's going to be mistakes made. There's a human behind your business. Going back to the Life is Labs, you've got to humanize your business. People want to deal with humans. And so businesses are becoming more humanized, especially the small businesses that are in this room, but even for big businesses, it doesn't matter what size you are, you can leverage that. And that's why I showed that quote. I thought it was perfect. That's what social media is all about, is that that person, because I asked her, well, are you going to buy some stuff for your two labs? And she goes, absolutely. Down the road, I will continue to buy from them, because now I feel like I have a relationship. And that relationship has only been developed digitally. 